Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Rotor World Football Show. I am Patrick Darty, joined by Mr. Denny Carter. It's Tuesday, April 16th. We're only 225 days away from the NFL draft. That's it. That's it. It feels like we're 4,000 days away from the draft. We're actually only nine. Uh, we're getting deep into silly season, as our producer Adam noted to us before the show. Uh, we're going to talk about we've, – we've done a lot of draft coverage this year. We're going to do more. We're going to have Mr. Eric Froton on sometime before the draft. We talked a lot about prospects. We're going to talk about one in particular kind of off the jump today and the narrative surrounding uh, Brock Bowers, who Denny and I both think is just going to be an instant mega bust. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nearly that simple. No. He has a very complicated evaluation. Could be a truly elite – fantasy player uh, there's just a lot to sift through with brock bauer so we're going to get to that we're going to check in on some some veterans uh, t higgins and his contract situation Cortland sutton and his contract situation Devonte smith and his contract situation which is that he was extended mm-hmm. uh, titans coaches have been talking for some reason uh, about tony pollard and tajay spears oh. Traylon burks still a guy who's around in the league still around. then he wants to talk about how screens in the NFL and how they can be a quarterback stat. Uh, Denny, quarterback is, of course, where we begin. Yep. Yeah, it's silly season. We have everyone visiting the commanders and trying not to get drafted by the commanders. We have people basically like going to jail for Caleb Williams takes that are so, so bad. Uh, we're seeing this a lot of April, like mid-April is when you start getting that oh. is truly a tra- – like Caleb Williams, he's never going to throw a pass in the NFL. Well, the, the the hot take industrial complex has to go on, and and but the uh, machine is not being fed right now. So so you so it, it's malfunctioning, and people are go, are losing their minds about player takes. Yeah, so it's either he's never even he's not he's going to lose the job in camp. He's never even going to play, or like he's already in Canton, things of that nature. But when it comes to quarterback prospect discourse, you have a pretty simple rule. That I do. A tweet, one of your various tweets that has become kind of an ongoing football Twitter meme. Let's just take the audience through. Uh, one yeah. Time. So we have it up on the screen here. I, if you're if you're listening to this in uh, podcast form, I'll read it to you. It's from uh, it's from February nineteenth, twenty twenty three. It goes: If a quarterback prospect is good, he's Mahomes. Don't make this complicated. And I, you know, I I came up with that because I could already feel the creep back in 2023 i could feel the caleb williams is mahomes creep happening and now it's just full-blown everywhere all the time i was watching espn today (laughs) and it's right there on the screen quarterback comparisons caleb williams and patrick mahomes and it's you know part of me understands because caleb williams does you know he creates on the run throws off platform makes unbelievable throws i get all that but i do think that it's a slippery slope and i think that any quarterback who's good at scrambling and making plays out of structure is just simply going to be comp to Mahomes when there's only one Mahomes and, and no one can do what he does, including Caleb Williams. It has become the classic, like uh, dribbles a ball. Well, one time, and now he's Michael Jordan, right? Or I saw this guy score a goal. He's now Wayne Gretzky. Uh, someone is hitting every fairway and a shockingly good putter. He's Tiger Woods. Tiger, Yes, and, that's right. And, 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 you, by the way, you compare Scotty to Tiger. Let me look up. Okay. He's one. Uh, two majors, and you can uh, He's won three, I think. Now no, it's two, two masters, I believe. I don't know if he's won another. Maybe he has. Uh, well, and I, I, the numbers say that Scotty is in the Tiger realm right now. Oh, so there you go. So uh, Caleb that. Williams is Mahomes, and Scotty is Tiger Woods. You heard it. I also think that there's a like a like a mental aspect to to it, like a dog aspect that you can't really match Mahomes in. Um, Mahomes is 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 like a magician on the field, not, not in the way that he throws the ball that, that also is miraculous at times, but in the way that he understands what the defense is doing, what his players are doing, like how to get a call from the refs, um, being five steps ahead of everybody else on the field, that's Mahomes advantage. And to comp anybody to him is unfair to that prospect, including Caleb Williams. If Caleb Williams is not instantly Mahomes, People are going to start whispering, oh, he's a bust. What are you, you going to do? You know what the responsible comparers do, Denny, is they just compare uh, any quarterback prospect to Josh Allen yeah, well, so, but, uh, or, or Lamar Jackson. Those are the big three right now. Uh, I saw this guy be fast once. He's Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Uh, this one guy looks pretty big. He's Josh right. Allen. Right. He's big, and he, he kind of plays with his hair on fire, so he's Josh Allen. He's big. Uh, he wasn't even good at Wyoming. He's Josh Allen. The, 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 perhaps the worst – quarterback comp uh in this class is people saying well, Jaden Daniels is Lamar that's 
simply not the case. I mean, it, 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 it's tragically they're, not the case. They're very different. They're very different. Like, like, you know, Lamar is way more creative. He keeps his eyes up. Like he throws on the run. Jaden Dan- Daniels doesn't do that at all. Okay, I, I, I really, I don't know. Uh, importantly, as we've talked about on the show, Lamar Jackson refuses to take hits, which is great. And Jaden Daniels loves to he take loves hits. It. So it's it. Th- these comps are getting lazy. Uh, Jaden Daniels only feels alive if he's getting flattened by a, a Tesla Cybertruck. I just, <laughs> I just don't. This, I mean, the and. I think uh, the most wishful part of the Jaden Daniels profile, I think, and there are several, is that coaches are going to mold him into a guy who steps out of bounds, who slides, who avoids the big hit. That you you don't coach that out. Genuinely, of never happens. It's never Genu- happened. Like, genuinely, never. Uh, they tried that with RG three for like four years. Um, Car- it, it, Carson Wentz, any day now, is going to stop getting absolutely destroyed by outside linebackers right. for a two yard running game, and yes. he's not even a starter. That's right. And, and, but, but guys who come into the league with that ability and that willingness to not take the hit, Russell Wilson, I, I know you're not the modern day Russell Wilson, but the more mobile Russ from five or six years ago, never took a hit, always stepped out of bounds. He did that in college too. Lamar did that in college as well. And it carries over. And Jaden Daniels propensity to get, uh, you know, annihilated is going to carry over. Andrew Luck had just taken on like five fewer linebackers in his career. He probably would have never had to retire. He was another guy like Andrew Luck. If he can stop getting absolutely smithereens for no reason, uh, he's going to be a future. I cringed. I cringed a lot watching Andrew Luck. Uh, He was humongous, but talk about a guy who just could not have the dog coached out of him. Like no, that's right. On taking on every single linebacker, it was a little, yeah, it was a little bit like Anthony Richardson, um, in that he was huge. You know, Luck was huge back, not now, very small today, but he's, he, he's, he's he a book reader huge. now. I believe, I believe we're bigger than Andrew Luck today, <laughs> uh, but he he was huge, and it, but even with that frame, he still couldn't injury wise survive the NFL. And I worry, I worry about that for Anthony Richardson. You know, the tragedy of Andrew Luck's career, Denny, is that he read one book. He did read a, he read, he read a book and he became completely uh, unattractive and unappealing to every NFL team. He should have never, ever read a book. So Denny and I are doing a really poor job of hiding our belief that Jaden Daniels will be a bust. Uh, We're going to try to do a slow. Yeah. Mega bust. Yeah. Well, it's funny because even that we don't truly believe. He he does all the things a future bust does, but uh, players like that also can be model breakers. That's my honest opinion on Jaden Daniels. Like he doesn't conform to a lot of things that would like make like a, like an on paper elite like ten year franchise quarterback. But some of the people on paper who become elite ten year franchise quarterbacks were like Patrick Mahomes who came into the league doing a lot of things. A lot of things that those players do do, but also a lot of things that those players didn't do. So that, that's what it comes down to Jaden Daniels. I genuinely believe he could be a model breaker, but I think he'll have to be a model breaker. Right. Denny, well, Brock Bowers had to be a model breaker. He's on the smaller side. He did not test. There's lots of debate about his athleticism, apparently. No debate about his box scores. No debate about his dog levels. Uh, t- take, take the audience through. This raging fantasy Twitter Brock yeah. Bowers debate, fueled in part by the former host of the show, Mr. Josh Norris, who, who was just trying to have a nice Friday on he, he Twitter. Was. And now the quote tweets are still rolling in. Josh was, of course, right. He tweet. was right. And he, he should tell right. everybody, stop yelling at me. I'm right. Stop he, booing me. He was quite right. And he is still being booed. He's so, still so being booed. Take the audience into this. Yeah. So, so Josh Norris basically said that in order to be special, you know, the, these first round tight ends have to be hyper athletic and we have to know that they are from a testing standpoint. And Brock Bowers has done checking my notes, no testing this off season. And he is constantly hurt. So we don't, so, okay. Yes. I guess you could say I watched him on TV once and he looked fast. Okay. That, that doesn't, that doesn't check any boxes for me. No. Right. Looking fast on ESPN at 7.15 p.m. Saturday against yeah. Ole Miss. Right, uh, right. Well, he was he was faster than a linebacker. It looks fine to me. Uh, like, like that. that's not testing. That's not there, there, There's no reason to 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 use that as a way to analyze a future first round pick. And he is he is going to go in the first round. So we don't we don't know about the testing. Josh was making that point and he was he was correct. I guess people are just so wrapped up in Bowers, so invested in Bowers being a generational tight end 
that they the thing that does not exist, of course. In, in this, and this leads me to my second point, um, which is uh, the you know the 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 ringers Shio Kapadia uh, made a great point on the X platform, formerly known as Twitter. He said uh, he, he said about Bowers in the past ten years, nine tight ends have been picked in the first round of the NFL draft. Okay, so we got that nine tight ends. That's that's our sample size. They've combined for zero All Pro nods and one mm-hmm. one thousand yard season. One of the nine, David and Joku. Got a second contract from the team that drafted him, Dalton Kincaid and Kyle Pitts, to be determined. It's a bad look. We are we are running cold on these hyper-athletic tight ends. I think that that should give pause to folks who want to take Brock Bowers in the top 10 or top 15. And just because it hasn't worked in the past, it's not the – it genuinely could work. But these hyper-athletic day one, he's not really a tight end. They're kind of like a unicorn that refuses to be caught. Like they, everyone is a unicorn type prospect. Like you just got to believe, like, I know this, like he seems in between a receiver and a tight end, but just trust me, this is the time it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, it's going to work at some point because at, at some point, like it is to be a special athlete at that size of that position. Like it shouldn't just keep failing over and over again, but yeah, it, I, and I'm sure it's not like, like predetermined to fail, but just like coaching staff seem to have very little idea how to use these kind of players. And maybe there's, we haven't had the right like team and staff fit yet. Yeah. Cause that's another thing, like an unacknowledged unspoken aspect of, of this. So it is, it's not a guy you can just put out there like an elite receiver or an elite running back who it doesn't really matter what the coach is doing. They're going to just, they're going to, their natural ability is going to take over and they're going to make plays. It's a that's tight right. end position. You have to be used correctly. And coaching staffs have a very hard time using these kind of players correctly. It's why, and I mentioned this on on a show last week, I think when Kyle was on, uh, I think it it really, really does hinge on where Brock Bowers lands. And I know people might roll their eyes and say, well, of course it does. It always does. And that that's true to an extent. But I, I do think that some players can succeed almost anywhere except for Arthur Smith's offense. And, and, and I, but I think that Bowers, is likely more likely than not to be drafted by a team that really won't know how to use him or won't be willing to learn how to use him, whether on the outside, whether in the slot, whatever it is, like you said, Kyle Pitts was called a unicorn. I mean, that's the only word that you heard coming out of of Florida was he's a unicorn. We were all very excited about him. He tested off the charts. He was some of some of us were excited about him. Insanely athletic. You were not as excited as others. And and the people people booed you and they and they were wrong. They did. Um, and uh, and and uh, here, here's and then the, the la- last point I wanted to make is that these Bowers Pitts types, not so much Kincaid because he's more of a PPR like uh, cheat code, but um, a scam, I should say. But the, these these hyper athletic guys who can get down in the steam, can outrun defenders. They're they're relying on such low percentage throws to create fantasy points like like do i want my tight end like like getting you know having an a dot of like 15 yeah i don't want that like that that's not good yes sometimes you're gonna hit it hit one and they're gonna and they're gonna score an 80 yard touchdown and that's awesome but if you don't get that long play you got nothing unless the guy's eating up underneath stuff this is this league i come back to this all the time this league is just check a check down league you got to get a guy who's going to catch those checkdowns or at least be involved in that part of the game. I don't know if Bowers would be involved. That's a very, very good point. And a few of my final points on Bowers, someone who would actually probably benefit being drafted outside the top 10, who by definition is going to a better setup, hopefully a better coaching stack. Cause you know, there's talk now of him sliding outside the top. 10. I don't know if people will say it's a slide at this point. Mm-hmm. If he goes outside the top 10, if he could go more in like that 11 to 24 range, maybe he'll end up with a better coaching staff, the better quarterback, a better situation that might help his chances of future success. But when it comes to down to Bowers, this doesn't sound like I'm trying to make this a bit or a joke, but one of the first moments I got concerned about Brock Bowers was last fall. I believe it was before the Missouri game, which I foolishly thought Mizzou might win. Cool. And they were talking <laughs> all about how he had the special ankle procedures, trying to get back really mm-hmm. fast, coming back from his most recent uh, ankle injury, his most recent injury, as you alluded to, he had a lot of minor injuries in college. That was like the very first Reddit, like, oh, this guy is in college and he's already getting like an like an experimental like ankle operation. Tightrope is it called the tightrope? Was rope the tightrope, which isn't that experimental, but it's still not a common procedure. 
Uh, and I was like, oh man, this guy's already getting tight ropes to come back. Honestly. That's right. It's not good, man. No, I, I just feel not. like there are some red flags. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, if he if he for some reason dropped past the top fifteen or into the bottom of the first round, I think that he becomes like a must must take just 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 to see, just to get crazy. Let's see what happens with this with this hyper athletic tight end. But I'm just, I mean, it, tying up that much draft capital, it's such a it's it, it's such a, a a precious resource, right? And you're dra- and you're and you're tying it up into a hyper athletic unicorn tight end. We we kind of know how that goes and it's not good and not i read so lance zerline uh, nfl.com one of the most expected respected talent evaluators mm-hmm. in the entire game i love reading his stuff i always do and i i couldn't help but be a little troubled by the final sentence from his bowers write-up which was very positive uh-huh. uh, but it said it might take a year for him to acclimate to defenders who are bigger faster and longer but he appears destined to become a highly productive nfl player with pro bowl upside and it's just Oh man, the NFL, that's pretty rare. I mean, tight end is one position, I guess, where it's not rare, where tight ends infamously develops, even though they're developing faster now. Like, I don't know, if it's a rookie, if you're not beating the right. bigger, faster, longer defenders, this isn't like baseball. I don't know if you're going to learn to hit the curveball ever, so to right. speak. And like, it, this is a game of strength and athleticism frequently right off the bat. And if you're counting on a guy to become like a different kind of athlete, and you're, it's just like, I don't know. I do a lot of a lot Maybe of coaching, savvy, but yeah, I don't know. Dude. That, that's why I think a lot of coaching staffs don't have the required creativity or willingness to experiment with a guy like this. Maybe some do, and and I'll be surprised. But man, I just feel like he's Bowers is more likely than not to end up in a place where they're like, I, I don't know what to do with this kid. I know, just please do put him. He needs to be with the head coach who's offensive minded. So first, it needs to not be an offensive coordinator project, like a coordinator who could be. Who's beholden to powers beyond himself? Yeah, right. It needs to be a head coach who is offensive minded, and it needs to. I mean, Desmond Ritter is one of the reasons why Kyle Pitts' career is just going nowhere right now. And it, it can't be, as you said, spoiler alert. You can say this with every single prospect. I just think Brock Bowers is even more sensitive to landing spots. Yes, that's than, a good way to put it. Um, and we're I even mean, more. I'm sorry, but generally, just don't draft tight ends in the top ten. I know. I know. It. No, I know. It truly is the ultimate, but it might work for us. No, yeah, and, right. And just, it hasn't. I mean, look at the meme. Look at the look at the. It might work for us meme, and then and then refuse. Tell get in the draft room and say we are not taking a tight end in the top ten. Whatever we do today, we're not doing that. Let's take a guard. Uh, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back after this. The countdown is on. Wednesday is the 100-day mark to the Summer Olympics in Paris. Tune in this summer on NBC and Peacock to see the greatest athletes in the world go for gold in the City of Light. I will be watching the Olympics 24 hours a day. I will watch a lot. I'm looking forward to golf. Oh, that's right. That's right. What's the course supposed to be like over there? You know, I don't know. I, I am going to look into that. But a lot of guys are are competing to be their country's representative uh, in the Olympics. And it's it's exciting. Should be good. Are we allowing live golfers into the Olympics? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I I, uh, I I haven't been keeping track of that. But uh, possibly. I mean, that would be awkward. But yeah. Bryson DeChambeau getting to wear the stars and bars over in France. Well, you have what they call uh, Patrick Reed, Captain America. So I guess he's automatically in. I, don't know. I know your guy, Tiger 2.0, Scotty. He'll hopefully be there. Uh, oh, gold. oh, yeah. Gold for his country. But yeah, the Olympics, I will be. I, in fact, I, recently, my wife scheduled a small trip during the Olympics and may have not been happy about it. I'm going to Greece during the Olympics. Oh, wow. Um, Denny, un-American, unpatriotic, un, uncorporate. Uh, I thought you worked for NBC. I do well. Thankfully, I'm at they least have... going somewhere where you, I can watch NBC. Right. Th- thankfully, they do have NBC in Greece, so we're. <laughs> they do. Well. Wow. I didn't yeah. know that. I mean, are, on my phone. Are there Greek versions of you and I? Hey, I don't know. That might be geolocked over there. By the way, I wouldn't oh, count on that. Well, we're, now we're now I'm in trouble. I don't know. Yeah. Denny trying to watch an NBC Greece and getting immediately canceled. We are trying to watch on NBC Rotor World Football Show. We're done talking about potential draft busts. Uh, moving on to some redraft news for 2024 and just how to properly evaluate T. Higgins, uh, who he said he does anticipate playing for the Bengals this year, even though we'll know for sure by after the draft. That if a T. Higgins trade is going to go down, it should go down draft week, as I say, with extreme confidence. I guess I don't actually really know if that's true, but that's generally how these things work. If a star player is going to get traded during the offseason, it's either going to happen 
before the draft or not happen at all. But Denny T is someone I feel like every year, like the the ADP aspirations just outstrip the reality by a little bit. Where he's a guy who's never the number one on his own team because of Jamar Chase. Right. He's a guy who's more of a boundary game, which we know is not quite a fit in the modern NFL, and this is more inconsistent from a fantasy perspective. He's a guy who's never come close. Um, to having like a fully healthy season. He got almost there in 2022, but he misses usually only two or three games every year. Last year was five. Just what are T, T against I, I feel like every time you pull up a stats, you expect him to have like 39, 40 yeah. career touchdowns. He's never scored more than seven, uh, which is not, it's not like he's a, a, a bum in that regard, but uh-huh. what is realistic for T Higgins and redraft fan? Are we, we're giving up the ghost on T Higgins could be a backdoor wide receiver one. I'm assuming. I think that that is contingent on crazy touchdown production. Like if he has like a touchdown outlier season uh, where it's like a Cortland Sutton situation where he's, sco- he's scoring a touchdown on every other catch, then yeah, I, I, I think that he, he could actually get to that wide receiver one territory. Um, but we can't bank on that. Obviously it's uh, definitely unlikely. So we, we have a guy whose yards per route run uh, has been pretty abysmal of late uh 1.8 yards per route run in 2022 that dropped to 1.6 in 2023 um like you said he's on the boundary a lot uh, last year he played out wide on 83% of his snaps for the Bengals um it didn't used to be that way by the way uh, before I, I guess what well, was it before Jamar Chase um did did, did they come uh, he was they, in the year one year in the league one year before yeah. Jamar Chase right so he he was playing thir- almost 30% from the slot before chase came into the league and i i think that that would be interesting if he ended up with another team and they said we're not just going to stick him on the outside and tell him to run fast and go deep uh he'd be much more interesting in the slot but his profile for fantasy purposes is unappealing on several levels i think it's unappealing from like you're not going to get like a wide receiver one like it's not in the fourth or fifth round where you're like getting a secret wide receiver one like you can still be a very strong wide receiver two and to lend a little context those yards per out run like if you're over two that's starting yeah. to get into like you're you're a higher end wide receiver and yeah those numbers have just come down for t higgins the past year partly because of the injury just last year you had 1.66 it's not like a truly awful number but it, it's not a, a top 24 receiver it's not inspiring by any means no. yeah no and it was way down and he he had never been like a truly elite from a yards per out run perspective. He kind of got there in 2021, but he was always more like middle of the pack. And it came down a lot last year. Qu- quarterback was injured. He was injured. Uh, but T2, it's just a weird situation. Is he really just going to be playing on this one year deal? Like, I feel like a lot of times these situations where the player knows they're gone the following year, even though it's a contract year, kind of tend to go sideways. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, T, no. yeah I, I'm not talking myself into T. Like T's one of the classic guy. I'm not making arguments for T anymore. Basically, in the mid rounds, I'm going to make arguments against him when I'm on the clock, and I'm going to let other people talk themselves into T. That's kind of where I'm going. Yeah. Also, just to get back to that scenario where you know he he produces touchdowns at a very high level, um, he's not really super involved traditionally in the red zone game like that's that's jamar chase that's traditionally joe mixon before he went to houston um the the Bengals don't seem to target t higgins or think of him much as a weapon inside the red zone or inside the green zone which doesn't make a lot of sense you know on the surface because he's a big guy you would think that that uh that that would fit but it, it they haven't so i i do think that his his ceiling is very much limited in this offense yeah, just that's when he needs to be viewed like for years and years by the community. He's been viewed as like a next step guy. I think it's just time to admit the next step is the next step maybe is coming if he gets traded somewhere and is the one. Right. One. right. Yeah. Then we go back to T mania. Uh, but if he does not get traded, he should no longer be viewed as a next step guy. This maybe where I'm, I can I'm with on. you there. Yeah. Uh, Cortland Sutton was a next step guy for a long time. Then he tore his ACL in 2020. Has not really been the same since. It's a contract year. He's skipping voluntary OTAs. Uh, the, the Broncos finally traded Jerry Judy, but like Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, I feel like with someone like, every six weeks, one of the league employed insiders would be like, hey, the Broncos might trade Cortland Sutton. And they just never, ever do. Yeah. And so I, I don't even know there's like a ton to say 
about 29 year old Cortland Sutton, although he did score 10 touchdowns last year. Yeah. And just kind of when I was thinking about Cortland Sutton, I asked you, like, I know it's Sean Payton, who has traditionally been a coach who produces fantasy value. But when I look at this Broncos team right now, I see what look is shaping up as maybe the single worst fantasy team yes. in offense in the NFL heading into 2024. We don't know who the quarterback situation is be, or do we know who is the Broncos quarterback? Well, it's the it's uh, what's his name that all the coaches love. But I mean, they're going to draft a quarterback. Okay, I was like, but they didn't sign like Gardner Minshew. Is Gardner no. Minshew and the Raiders and the Broncos at the same time? Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> Cortland Sutton. It doesn't strike me as someone to build around um, at, at his age with the injury history. You talk about yards per route run and you, you know, you want, you want your, your, your number one receiver to be over two, maybe even well over two. Uh, well, last year, Cortland Sutton was at 1.66. The year before it was 1.55. The year before that it was 1.43. Um, you know, the guy has one, one and a half good seasons under his belt. Uh, and he he is a good red zone threat, and he, he does produce touchdowns at a high clip. I'm not sure how sustainable that is. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's pretty bleak that, you know, he's going to ask for a new contract, and rightfully so. He's only guaranteed $2 million, uh this year. Uh, he, he should definitely be making more than that uh, ju- you know, based on last year. But seeing him as the number one receiver in this offense, oh, man, that's not good. Like, you know, shout out to the Patriots or whatever, but the Broncos might have the worst receiver room in the league. They might. Well, there will be someone worse than this receiver. I mean, Marvin Mims, I guess. It's not happening. Marvin Mims is just like the latest in a long line of day two. Like, was he a spark star? He seems like someone's probably a spark star. Yeah, right, right. Super athletic guy. It's not. Yeah, that's not happening. Come on. It's not happening. I mean, Sean Payton, like, took one look at him. He's like, yeah, no, so. Sean Payton does, literally doesn't have time for that. No, he really does not. He is, I yeah. mean, there, there's a lot of issues with this team, and getting Marvin Mims three targets over the middle uh, per game is not one of them. He, like he is they, not yeah. reading all that, and Marvin Mims is like, it's five words. I feel like you could probably read that. <laughs> <laughs> nah, sorry, kid. You can't read that. Yeah, by the way, Jared Stidham. And- well, yeah, I was absolutely terrified they had added someone that was not Jared Stidham. And people were like, you're forgetting – Right. About, uh, I'm trying to think of yeah, like Jacoby Brissett. Idiot. Yeah, you're forgetting about Jacoby Brissett. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Like, I mean, hey, well, Jacoby Brissett would probably be the best Broncos quarterback since Peyton Manning. He would easily would. Yeah. Be. The Broncos, man, they are fixing to do something dumber than hell at quarterback. They got the number 12 pick. They're not. I had to double check like five times. They actually own the rights to this pick. They do currently still own the rights. I the number 12. Over. They're, they're going to do something. He, Sean Payton wants to trade four first rounders to move up to number four or something like that. I don't know, man. I think that, I mean, I don't know. I keep thinking Bo Nix to Denver makes all the sense. Yeah. The I, 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 I love that fit. As an instant, Bo Nix will be a bust truther. Denver is one spot where I could see it not being an instant bust situation. That I mean, I he's know. willing to go along with the system and he's good at the kind of throws that Sean Payton demands of his quarterback. Like it's like he can play that noodle armed Drew Brees, late era Drew Brees role in the in the Payton offense. And that that offense was still plenty productive. I I and and by the way, uh, we're gonna talk about this in a second. But if Bo Nix goes to Denver, whoever is going to be their RB1 or at least their primary pass catching back is going to catch 200 passes. I, I really dislike this Zoomer phrase, and it's probably not even a Zoomer phrase anymore. But Bo Nix at twelve would be a vibe, and not, <laughs> not a good one. That would be the vibe of desperation, the scent, yeah, of desperation. Absolutely, and from a team build, building standpoint, probably not a great move. I'm just, you know, talking from a fantasy standpoint, could be worse. Could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah, that would be that would be one where I, I couldn't lie. I'd be a little intrigued if Bo Nix ended up in Denver alongside uh, Jarrett Stidham and Jacoby Brissett. Uh, <laughs> no, so man. The, the to, Nooch. Not ben trying, DiNucci. Not trying to spread, spread misinformation. Jacoby Brissett's back on the Patriots, right? Uh, yes. I think so. I think he's back on the Patriots. There's no, way, there's no way to find out. There is absolutely no way to find out. There is a way to find out what Devontae Smith signed for. It's three years, $75 million bought out. The final year of his rookie deal, actually, probably not. Probably tacked on to the end of his rookie contract. He's now an eagle, the sec for at least a second contract. Another guy who was one of the victims of things going like totally haywire for the Eagles last year. Another guy where I just feel like 
his long-term upside is capped because he's not even the number one on his own team. Yeah. Uh, is that the correct way to look at it though, Denny? And cause it's still the very same, like there's not many miles to feed in this offense. I mean, they all get hurt. It seems like but, <laughs> uh, it's one of the narrowest offenses in fantasy, which we absolutely love. We do. Uh, Devonte Smith. Is he sneaking into wide receiver 10 to 12 range or is he another guy? We just got to accept that he's a wide receiver too. If you get him in draft, that's fine. But yeah, what, what is the state of Devonte Smith heading into 2024? So, yeah, I mean, just to emphasize how concentrated uh, this, you know, target target tree is for, for the Eagles. We have 70% of the team's targets went to wide receivers last year, primarily A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. That led the league by a long shot over teams, over similar similarly constructed teams like the Dolphins, like the Rams, like the Jaguars. So, uh, it you know, the ball is going to three places, uh, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, and that's it. That's the end of the list. Uh, so I do, I do think that he's a safe, he's like a nice safe wide receiver two option. Um, I, I think that his wide receiver one case would have to be really would have to involve AJ Brown missing time, missing significant time. And then Smith stepping up as the unquestioned number one. Uh, but the, the team really doesn't, the Eagles really don't pass enough. in or I think for, for both of these guys to get into the wide wide receiver one, the top 12 category. Uh, so I'm, I'm not banking on that this year now. I guess there aren't many people probably thinking beyond this at this point, but you, you hit the nail on the head with Devontae Smith where he's a nice, safe wide receiver too. Yeah. We just have to accept that there's not another gear coming. Maybe there could be if he were in a different situation, but now he's not definitively not in another situation. He signed for the long term in Philadelphia, and he, he's a meat and potatoes wide receiver too. Mm -hmm. He's going to help the cause. But he's not going to be putting the cause over the top in fantasy. Unless and sometimes, yeah, sometimes meat and potatoes is okay. You know, it, it, it that fills your tummy. And and you 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 look at your your roster at the end of the day, and you got 16 PPR points from Devontae <laughs> Smith, and you're very happy. It's good. It's fine. Trying to find what Devontae Smith's exact underdog ADP is because I was going to ask. Uh, T, okay, his exact underdog ADP was 35.3. So the end of round three. Um, he is yeah. going nine spots ahead of T. Higgins. That seems right to me. Yeah, yeah. But I was going to ask you T. Higgins versus Devonte Smith. No, I, I would take Smith straight up. Uh, even with that uh, nine pick uh, adjustment, I would still go with Smith. Yeah. Everything about Devonte is just a little steadier. The health is a little steadier. Uh, the targets are a little steadier. The, the, the overall ceiling is probably higher for T. Higgins, but the floor is just so much higher for Devonte Smith. That I feel yeah. uh, more comfortable betting on Devontae Smith heading into 2024. Um, do we feel comfortable betting on Nick Chubb at all, Denny? Coming back, I mean, it was one of the worst looking knee injuries I've ever seen, but kind of every report on Nick Chubb's knee injury was like, it looked really bad, folks. We admit that, but it's not as bad as we feared. Um, they reworked his contract. Uh, is this going to be the return of Nick Chubb, no matter what, 5.3 yards per carry every week? He's a, a mid-range RB1. We know the next level is never coming for Nick Chubb, but the floor is so high that he still gets into the top five or six at running back. Or is this this the case where injury optimism just gets you into trouble? Right. And like You should let someone else bet on Nick Chubb, who was already starting to get a lot of mileage on those legs, even before the knee injury. Yeah. Uh, what's your early spiel on Nick Chubb? Could he become a value because people think like me and he falls too far? Or are people just going to – see like the track record of consistency right. and make him not a value. I mean, a, a, everyone is a value at some point, right? I, I mean, there would be a point where I would say, okay, this, it doesn't make any sense for me to not draft Nick Chubb here. But I think that name recognition and past production will, will stop him from falling to that point. I, injury optimism is real. I've had it for players, oh, yeah. especially players I've, been been high on or who have delivered for me in fantasy like we you know we have to remember a lot of folks playing fantasy football are you know attached to their emotional memories of of these guys and like nick chubb really came through for me in this season whatever and so i'm gonna take them and i my guy's gonna get back to form and you know th this injury was not your you know, average, you know, uh, uh, con no contact sort of ACL. I thought they're claiming that it basically was, oh which I God. don't really believe. Well, whatever. But... I mean, his leg turned around. So, yeah. I mean, it's, 
It's like they stopped showing it on TV. Uh, that, thank, thank you, Denny. Uh, I mean, I that you know, I'm it was the class. I mean, Joe Buck was like, "We're not showing that." I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm not a doctor, but when it got when it, when the TV is like when the TV cameras are like, "No, we we literally can't show this anymore. It's too disgusting." Then I'm gonna say it's bad. I made um, the horrible mistake because they showed a few replays and like I could not see it. I was like, "What?" And then I rewound, and then I eventually yeah, it is it is a, a car crash situation. Can't can't yeah. unsee it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think your best case scenario, you draft him at a premium. Uh, what, what is he going right now? Well, I was going to say, so it sounds like everyone's a value at some point. It sounds like Nick Chubb is probably a value at his current underdog ADP of RB 27. I have a hard time believing this is even accurate, but it's, uh, he's currently the RB 27 His ADP is just inside the top 100 at 94. I feel like as the, the health drum beat stays positive, that will probably increase greatly. But I mean, if you could get Nick Chubb outside the top 24, I feel like that's a bet you probably just have to make, right? That's not bad. I, I, I would I would guess that the, the wide receiver heaviness of, of underdog drafts in, you know influences his uh, ADP dropping. I would I would guess that in more casual leagues, he'll be more heavily drafted, uh, more highly drafted. Also, we have to remember it's a it's uh yes, it's April. It's April and uh the, the drum beat is going to be strong in July and August. Uh, Nick Chubb's all the way back. He's he's three months ahead of schedule. He had this uh, procedure in Germany, and he's doing this and that. It's always Germany. And they fl- they flew him to the moon, and they put moon rocks in his knee, and it's it's great. Oh. And all this stuff, right? And I'm you know, but and and so people are oh okay, well then I can just take him as an RB one. Uh, but you're you're gonna have to wait. I mean, he's definitely not going to be ready to go to start the season that that's my in my estimation well, i just don't i don't i don't see him taking 20 carries in week one that's i think he'll probably be active in week one 20 carries probably is but it's another matter yes. but, but come on would you you can definitely see a scenario where it's like he's inactive for week one he might be active for week two maybe yeah yeah no know. no Ab- that is absolutely within the, the range <laughs> of plausible outcomes and so you laid out the positive scenario for his ADP, positive for him, and the, how it might skyrocket. I could also s- see it remaining totally stagnant if they just draft like a fourth round running back. I was like, oh, it's Joker. I'm like, I don't know, it's a fourth rounder. I'm like, yeah, but oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> people, yeah. If, they, if they if they get someone in like the first hundred and twenty picks at running back, people will be very very scared. And they did sign Deontay Foreman. Yeah. Well, and I think that's insurance. I think that that's, that's just pure insurance. So that I I feel like that is just pure insurance, especially considering the way Foreman's 2023 went, but so if they draft anyone with like reasonably high draft capital, even top 150 is reasonably high draft capital for running back. I could see his ADP just remaining stubbornly low all summer. Yeah, sure. uh, Yeah, Yeah. sure. We will move on to, uh, we'll talk about running back ADPs. Uh, new Titans offensive coordinator, some guy named Nick Holes. I mean, I is that. it Holes? I, just, uh, I think the T. Hopefully, hopefully we're not typoing on the site because we're we're putting holes on okay. roadworld.com. H O L Z. Uh, he says he views Tony Pollard and Tajay Spears as quote interchangeable. Yeah, <laughs> and he's right. And he's so right. He, he is the right. And is this just the classic? The Titans running back you should draft is whichever one currently has the lower 80. Probably. I mean, uh, uh, well, I don't know, man. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a anti Pollard guy. I, I, I mean, nothing gets him personally. He met, he met with us. He interviewed with us uh, at the Super Bowl. So he's a fine gentleman. Uh, but Tajay Spear, Spears is potentially special. I think as a runner, he has, a, you know, a lot less mileage on, on the, on the old legs. I, I'm, I'm totally out. On, on Pollard, I think that Spears eventually takes over this backfield. But it, I mean, this offensive coordinator holes saying that uh, Pollard is interchangeable with Spears. Doesn't that isn't that sort of uh, you know an underhanded criticism of the signing? It is. Yeah, it is. I I would say if you're trying to discern who this quote is good or bad for, I would definitely say it's better for Ty J Spears than the veteran who was targeted in free agency. I mean, it's also just like an admission that, yeah, Tony Pollard should be a committee guy. The Cowboys tried the lead back thing. Oh, we know he's coming back from a traumatic leg injury, but he's a committee guy. So, uh, yeah, 
it is it is remarkable. The, the Titans lost Derrick Henry, and they said, "Well, we got to sign a running back." Right? Yeah. They did. Panic. They panicked a bit. I, that was a, yes, that was a sheer panic move to be like, "Well, we lost the generational running back, so we have to sign a running back." Yes. Let's sign Tony Pollard. It's man, oh man, what a hor- what a horrible signing, honestly. All right. I mean, you said it, not me. I, I said it. I said it. The, the, the Titans are completely directionless. Um, they could be better for fantasy this year because vrabel has gone. But I, I, I think that generally this team has no idea what it's doing. No, they do not. And kind of not surprised. There have remained kind of an ownership flux where I think they continue to have the league, have trouble with the league accepting their ownership structure. I think like the, the primary order, Amy Strunk, I believe is her name, mm-hmm. like still doesn't have like enough shares or something. I, maybe they finally settled this. Yeah, there's they were like literally directionless for the NFL was not accepting their ownership structure. Mm. I think that actually did get resolved. But uh so yeah, we'll see what the Titans have. There. So, by the way, current ADPs, um, this is shockingly high for Tony Potter. RB23, only RB35 for Ty J Spears. That seems like auto let someone that's, else draft Tony Potter. Oh my goodness, that is a slam dunk. That's that's zero. That's like textbook zero RB. Take Ty J Spears and profit. That's zero thought. I mean, you, I don't. I, there's no consideration. Zero in, brain in that. Yeah. yeah, you just say, obviously, I'm taking Spears. And no, in no universe am I taking Tony Pollard at RB twenty three. <laughs> new zero brain drafting pioneered by Patrick. Darby. Oh, but you know what's going to happen? Pollard people are going to be bailed out because Spears is going to go down early in the season. And Pollard's going to be the workhorse, and he's going to get by on volume, and they're going to say, see? See, I told you. That's a little too early for doom counterfactuals. I, 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 I told you Spears is no good. Like, what? He hurt his ankle. I don't know what you want. I'm telling you now that we have to take a short break, and we'll be right back after this. Can Nelly Corda continue her hot start and fend off the LPGA's finest at the Chevron Championship? Tune in this week for the first major of the season, only on NBC and Peacock. It's still got golf on the brain. Uh, still, still haunted by the ease with which Scotty Shuffler won those matches. Yeah, he seemed to be just cruising at, at, at some point on Sunday where everybody else was collapsing, and he was like, I'm simply going to hit it in the fairway, hit it on the green, and I'm going to two-putt every yeah, single time. Really boring stuff. Glad it wasn't. <laughs> oh, come on. No, no. <laughs> golf g- golf needs a dominant player, and, yeah, and, that's, it does. and that's what you have with Nelly Corda, too. Nelly Cord is un- he she is a Scheffler like machine from T to green. I uh, I was looking at the stats today. I was grinding LPGA stats. We have uh, she's she's second in greens and regulation. Uh, she's uh, I believe top ten in in driving accuracy. Not super long, which which surprised me a little bit. By the way, the 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 longest player on the LPGA tour averages uh, two ninety off the tee. That wow, is remarkable. That's a lot of drive in there. And yeah, the, the men's tournament, this the men's tournament, uh, the men's field, the men's game, uh-huh. they've all just failed. Yeah, I mean, I remember when Rory was briefly the next Tiger. Spieth was definitely the next Tiger. Oh. Kepka was kind of Tigering, and like none of them can sustain it. So it'll be interesting to see if Scheffler. Okay, I, we'll move on to football in a second. The one reason I believe Scheffler can sustain it is because his short game is elite. It's actually the best in the world. So I, I think even if his long game falls off, short game's there. Yeah, having a short game stupid. <laughs> so, <God. laughs> so uh, uh, sticking with Titans offensive coordinator Nick Holes, by the way, he said Traylon Burks will quote unquote get what he earns this upcoming season. Uh, should Traylon Burks have an ADP? Probably not. Question oh probably. my goodness, that is what a what a shot across the bow. So yeah, should that's my literal question, like not a bit. Should Traylon Burks have an ADP, or should he just um? Play? In twelve team, yeah, like twelve like, team home leagues. Should Traylon no, Burks I don't really see why someone. <laughs> I don't see why someone would even, would even bother with that. I mean, you know, f- you know, we get into fourteen team leagues with the deep benches, baby. We're all in on Traylon Burks in the twenty third round. It's easy. He's scrolling to see what, even what his underdog ADP. I probably scrolled past it, but yeah, it's uh, it's probably low. Ooh. Yeah, he does not. So since it's underdog, he does have an ADP. Um, but it's wide receiver 92. I mean, it's it's going to require an injury to someone ahead of him, either DeAndre Hopkins or uh, Calvin Ridley. Uh, I, I, those two those two could be like an A.J. Brown, uh, Devontae Smith target share combo, I really think, in this Tennessee offense. Yeah, Traylon Burks, he was, he was going to be a special one in Dynasty. 
Yeah. Didn't get off to a good start. Nope. And man, NFL careers are so short. That's what the Brock Bowers and Zerline saying. Uh, maybe he won't have it as a rookie. It's like, ah, man, the average career is like four years. And like, it's longer if you're a star in fantasy, but. I just, I don't know, man. I mean, like, get, it. how often, especially for like a first rounder, if they get off to a rough rookie year, it almost never comes back around. The Burks thing was never going to work with Rabel. Uh, you know, no. Burks, Burks comes in, he's struggling with asthma, which obviously is not his fault. But Rabel wasn't reading all that. Like he was, he was like, okay, kid, you're not on the field. So, you know, get, get, get out of, get out of my sight. Like you're not part of this team. And, and he, you know, he has suffered the consequences. Now he has the offensive coordinator saying like, Hey, if you want to be on the team, you got to show me something like, you know, if you want to be part of this offense, do something. And just uh trail I take some McCord. I feel your pain. And mm-hmm. that was not nice. How they, that's my, that's my asthma inhaler, didn't he? Yeah, but you was, didn't. Bet, bet you didn't know I had asthma. Yeah, I, I did. I did. I did actually know. Uh, it's pretty uh, well controlled. I don't have to take it every day. But uh, I, I that was a weird time because I remember blurbing daily about Traylon Burks's his asthma, um, asthma, and and it was a big it was a big storyline because the team was f- first pretending it wasn't happening and then acknowledging it and being like, yeah, it's actually a huge deal. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. It was not good. Or damn, Traylon Burks. Wish he could have gotten a second chance somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But even though second chances never work either. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the NFL. I mean, this isn't baseball. Baseball, you get it, get on get on the Dodgers, get on the Rays. They mean like flatten out your your pitch delivery right. plane. They change up your pitch mix. Uh, everything's fine. Hey, did you so, watch your Cardinals playing the A's? I was gonna ask you if you watched your A's last night. I uh, did watch my A's last night. Did you have Sonny Gray? Is the question I would ask no, you. No, I didn't. Uh, you didn't, man. Uh, yeah, your A's, uh, not a lot of offense last night. Estuary Ru- Ruiz, who was mysteriously demoted, returned with a home run. Yeah. Uh, so prevented my Cardinals from getting the shutout. But R- love my tell A's. you what, uh, the Cardinals badly need to sweep this series. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> badly, badly need not to against sweep. my A's. Not yeah, against Denny's A's. Forget no. about it. Don't worry, they won't. And uh, don't worry, we won't forget to talk about quarterbacks and screens and how they can be a quarterback statistic, not an offensive coordinator statistic. You have an article coming out in a day or two. Just tell the folks what we're talking about here. Yeah. So I, you know, I looked into uh, quarterbacks tendencies to throw it to running backs to dump it off to running backs on screen plays. And um, you know, there's no perfect, I don't think perfect way to uh, analyze this, to look at this and say, and be able to separate the system Uh, from the quarterback and also jumbled in there is the ability, the pass catching ability of, of a running back. Right. And if you do, if you have one who's really good, like Alvin Kamara, at least back in the day, you're going to funnel targets to him uh, pretty consistently. If you don't have one, then there's no reason to. So it is, it's, it's hard to splice exactly right, but here's, here's what I have so far. And again, like Pat said, it'll be on the Roto world site uh, probably on Thursday. Um, so the Broncos really jumped out because Russell Wilson led all quarterbacks and passes to running backs last season. Um, after not really doing that throughout his career, especially in Seattle, uh, it's definitely a function of Sean Payton's offense. Uh, 32% of Denver's targets went to running backs last season. That was by far the highest rate oh, man. In, in the NFL. Talk about a sign your offense is going to be bad. Right. But I mean, that's kind of how it was with Drew Brees as well. It was. It um, was. That was. They were kind of the exception to the rule, I thought. I mean, they were well designed screens. And, and I think that it, it can work if you have a really smart quarterback and, and, a, and, a, and a good uh, good offensive line and a good pass catching running back. So I basically I'm just I'm just telling the folks, keep tabs on the Denver backfield. If someone is emerging as the number one pass catching guy in that backfield, you're probably going to want them, okay? Like, especially in PPR formats, especially if you just want to get some cheap points, you you target that guy. So that's one one thing that jumped out. Uh, obviously, Derek Carr jumped off the uh, spreadsheet. Uh, and I know you love you love this, Pat. Um, he was second behind Russell Wilson last year in passes to running backs. I think it's telling uh, that running back was rarely his first read, but rather a, sef- a, a safe check down option. That suggests the car is more prone to running back attempts than other quarterbacks. Um, You know, quarterbacks like uh, Jake Browning, like Will Levis, like Tua had, had a ton of 
first read targets to running backs to actually 62% of his first read targets were to running backs. Um, I, I just got to intervene. Talk about a sign. Like you, you're not, you should not be committing this player where the, you have to build the whole plane on yeah. running back targets. I, 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 I should, I should couch how I said that. Uh, 62% of his passes to running backs were first read. Okay. I was like, I knew that yeah. there was no that, 62% of the no, times no, were right, Devin right. HN, but still, uh, Man, that's a lot. Yeah. A lot, so, a so, but, but Carr, that was not the case with Carr. Carr was in the low 30s in that category. So it wasn't like the Saints were calling these plays and saying, Derek, you just got to dump it off to Kamara over and over. That was his choice. Okay. So, again, if it's Kamara, whether it's, you know, somebody else in this, in New Orleans backfield, that, that guy is going to get peppered with targets. Oh, it's something. Uh, I took that stat at face value. Like, I don't, I don't know if I remember Raheem Mostert having 220 targets. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I did misspeak. Yes. But... <laughs> no, no. I, I, too, I kind of barreled through that there. So no, no. Yeah. Um, um who, you said Josh Allen, by the way. Yeah, the time, Mr. Screen guy. Yeah, well, uh, somewhat. You know, he uh, last year uh, he was seventh in running back targets. Thirty-five um, percent of his running back targets were first read. That that represented an uptick from twenty twenty two. But Buffalo running backs uh, only saw a target on fifteen percent of his overall throws. That's you know in the bottom half of the league. Not really. Super impressive. James Cook obviously would be the main beneficiary of of that shift, but I I think that at least it changed my perspective on on Allen. I thought Allen was one of these rushing quarterbacks who were just simply not going to check down the running backs. It's not really the case. They really changed that up last year. One rushing quarterback though was not doing so. Denny, who was that? Yeah, well, uh, you have uh, Kyler Murray. Uh, well, two two of them, Kyler Murray and Lamar. So Lamar uh, was the one who st- stood out to me. Yeah. So Lamar, uh, in accordance with the, his perception, is not really mm-hmm. targeting the running backs. And, and here's the thing. It remained very low. Like, he was 24th in running back targets last year with 53. That was actually a pretty big increase over 2022, okay? So in the, in the Todd Munkin system, running backs were targeted more often, but still not a lot. It's It's all about, it's all about context and baseline. The Ravens were 20th. And running back target share last season. Okay. Uh, that doesn't sound great until you remember that they were 30th the year before. So it's a little bit of an uptick, but really not a lot to write home about. I still think that Derrick Henry will be completely like early down dependent and touchdown dependent in this offense. Sounds like really interesting stuff. The kind of article to bookmark as you start to get more serious about prepping for draft season, which man, I can't believe it. it's already mid April though. And like redraft season, so best ball season never ends. Like redraft season is uh, basically a one season away, three months away. Three months, yeah. It's kind of scary. Um, so time to start getting ready. I mean, a lot of our listeners of the show are probably already getting ready. No, oh, yeah. Uh, they, Unless they're been, taking like a baseball sabbatical like me. They've been getting uh, ready since February 1st. Let's be They have been getting ready since February 1st. So, uh, But check out Denny's article, I believe, on Thursday. Yep. Bookmark it. Return to it. And check out the show on Thursday. We'll be back with Kyle Dvorak. Maybe a guest. We're not entirely sure yet. We're trying to figure it out. Uh, well, we're going to do some more draft talk between now and next Thursday. We'll do some more redraft talk. There's probably going to be some news. There might be a trade or two. Could be a big trade or two. That'd be cool. That would be really cool. Uh, there could be. A, we'll see if there's a draft trade or two before draft night. Because the Vikings, when are the Vikings going to make their move? Yeah, what NFL. If you're listening, we need something to talk about for future podcasts. Let's get let's get this these trades going, please. Let's get the trades going. Uh, keep the pod fast, pod fast podcast feed going. For Denny Carter, I'm Patrick Darty. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back later this week. Hey, it's Matthew Berry from NBCSports.com and RotorWorld.com, and I want to thank you so much for watching whatever it is you just watched, or if nothing else being too lazy to click out of the autoplay after this video started, after whatever it is you actually wanted to watch finished. But now that you're here, I'd like to take a moment here to ask you respectfully, respectfully now, okay, I'm asking you respectfully to subscribe to the NFL on NBC YouTube channel. You'll get the latest Roto World fantasy news headlines, all sorts of great shows, including my own fantasy football happy hour. So go subscribe now. Again, I'm asking respectfully.